Good afternoon. I am Martha Minow. I'm the dean here at Harvard Law School. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce this event and to introduce Secretary James Baker. This is a great man. The world is different because of the actions, the steps, the negotiations undertaken by James Baker. When he served as a secretary, under Secretary of Commerce for Gerald Ford, when he served as Secretary of the Treasury under President Ronald Reagan, when he served as Secretary of State for President George H.W. Bush, in each of these roles, he demonstrated the possibility of making the world better by negotiation. Secretary Baker just explained to me that actually his background as a commercial lawyer was indispensable to the work that he later did. Learning how to make a deal, learning how to build a trusting relationship, absolutely central to, as it turns out, integrating the two parts of Germany. Building a foundation for a different form of negotiation in the Middle East. Secretary Baker's 1990 Cap David meeting with President Bush and former German Chancellor Helmut Kohl established the trust that opened the doors for the reunified Germany and its entrance into NATO. And I can tell, because I, I can tell you because I lived during that time, it wasn't obvious it was going to happen, at least from the outside. It's an extraordinary transformation and has laid the foundation for a much different world. Secretary Baker took the lead in building the international and military coalition that defeated the Iraqi forces in Kuwait. He played a key role in the landmark Madrid peace conference involving Israel and the neighboring Arab countries. Secretary Baker is the 10th recipient of the Great Negotiation Award. The previous recipients include Senator George Mitchell, U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Charlene Barshevsky, United Nations Special Representative Lakhdar Brahimi, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, former United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Sadako Ogata, and Bruce Wasserstein, Chairman and CEO of Lazar, the artist Christo and Jean-Claude, and the former President of Finland, Marty Atasari. For years to come, we will be so honored to include in this list of past recipients of this award, Secretary James Baker. I will say a word about the program of negotiation and then I will get out of here because you're not here to hear me. But the program of negotiation is something of which we are very proud here at the Harvard Law School and in part because it's not just our center. It's an interdisciplinary center that joins together three schools. It focuses on negotiation and conflict resolution its ability to connect theory in many different disciplines with practice is exemplary. Founded in 1983 and based here, it is a consortium of faculty, research, and staff from Harvard, from the MIT, from Tufts, also other Boston area schools. And I know this sounds like small potatoes, but for us, that's a successful negotiation. <laughs> So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panel and the discussion. But first, I would really like to have a round of applause for Secretary Baker. Uh, my name is Bob Manukin. I chair the program on negotiation. Thank you, Dean Minow, for your warm welcome. Uh, we are deeply honored to be celebrating <laughs> the work of James A. Baker III. As Dean Minow suggested, this is our 10th great negotiator program, and we have learned a great deal from each of them. And I know that we're going to learn a great deal more today. This year, like last year, this program is a collaborative effort between two Harvard programs, the program on negotiation uh, here at Harvard Law School and the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. 
It's my pleasure now to turn things over to the co-chairs of this afternoon's uh, proceedings uh, relating to the Great Negotiator uh, Award, and that is our moderators, Professor Jim Sabanius and Professor Nick Burns. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nick Burns. That's Jim Sabanius, so you can tell us apart. Uh, we're pleased that all of you are here. And this is a really a big day for Harvard University and for this unique joint venture between the Kennedy School, the Law School, and the Business School. We're honoring um, the person whom I think, as a former career diplomat, is the most consequential American Secretary of State in our memory. And certainly, I think if you did a, did a poll of my former colleagues at the State Department, who served in Republican and Democratic administrations, we've not had a Secretary of State who's been so effective at the art of diplomacy and the art of negotiations, and who's achieved so much for our country and who's strengthened our country. Today, we're going to talk about three of those achievements. The first will be German unification in NATO. We'll start with that, and we'll work on that for the first hour and 15 minutes. We'll then take a break, and after the break, we'll come back and Jim will chair that session. We'll talk about the Gulf War Coalition, this unique coalition that the Secretary and President George H.W. Bush put together uh, in the triumph over Saddam Hussein, and then the Madrid peace process, which is really the foundation stone of the modern Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiations as we've come to know them. But I couldn't be more honored that Secretary Baker is here today. A lot of the people who study with me, uh, students of mine, are here from both of my classes. We've talked about him as a negotiator, the fact that he was always the best prepared person in the room, the fact that he had a unique relationship with our president, a great foreign policy president, George H.W. Bush. And maybe we should begin the questioning there on German unification, Mr. Secretary, by asking you um, about your relationship with President Bush. You came into the, to the White House and, and the State Department in January of 1989 after the president's victory. Did you think in January, February 1989 that there was any possibility of a big event that might lead to the end of the Cold War? Well, before I, thank you very much, Nick, but before I answer that, let me uh, first say how delighted I am to be back up here at Harvard, even though I went to Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> and back in those days, we used to beat you in football. We don't, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. We had the Heisman Trophy winner, if you remember, you all over, you're too young to remember that. Last time an Ivy Leaguer was a Heisman Trophy winner was when Richard Kasmeyer, the class of 1952, which was my class, won the award. And by the way, we're going back this year for our 60th reunion. But it's great to be back up here <laughs> in Harvard and to see all of you. And, and before I answer Nick's question, let me say that uh, your, your professor, Burns, did an extraordinary job himself in serving this uh, country of ours. And he was in the Foreign Service for I don't know how many years, but I, I know for a fact he, he was there for the full four years that I was Secretary of State. And, uh, and, for the, and for the full four years of uh, the first term, at least, of President George W. Bush. So when, when did I think that uh, something, might, something uh, like the end of the Cold War might occur on our watch? And we didn't think that. We, thought it was, we hoped that might happen. We have, certainly were never sure that it would happen. The fall of the wall in November of 89 really came as a surprise uh, to most of the policymakers. You know, we knew maybe a month or so, maybe in September, I think it was, Hungary opened her border. And uh, after that border was opened, East Germans uh, began to flood, uh, flood out. And it wasn't too long after that in, uh, in November that, uh, that a low-level East German official announced in a routine announcement, he didn't, he, I don't think he understood the significance of what he was saying, but he said the board, the border is going to be open, or the, this, the, there will be free transit uh, between uh, one spot and another in, in Berlin. That, that, of course, was what triggered the uh, fall of the wall. And, uh, and that's uh, what triggered, at least uh, on our part, uh, uh, the imperative of trying to make sure that the Cold War, as it ended, ended peacefully, that it ended with a whimper and not with a bang. It didn't have to end with a whimper, but I think President George H.W. Bush was 
smart enough to understand, wise enough, had enough foreign policy experience. After all, he'd been our ambassador to China, he'd been director of the CIA, he'd been the UN ambassador. Uh, and uh, he got a lot of grief at the time, the wall fell, for not uh, gloating and pounding the chest and, and being more emotional about uh, the fact that finally, after 40 years, the West, led by the United States, had won the Cold War. And I remember he, he used to, we, we'd sit in these uh, meetings and he'd say, you know, one thing we ought to do is, is make sure we don't gloat. I don't want to hear anybody gloating about this because we got a lot of business to do still with Gorbachev and Chevronazi. Uh, and that took a wise man to, uh, to adopt that position in the face of a lot of domestic criticism. I never will forget a, a huge press conference shortly after the wall fell in the Oval Office and um, he was sitting at his desk and I was right there at his right side and we had a ton of press there and they were beating up on why can't you be a, a little more emotional. He finally looked up at him and he said, look, we got some business still to do. We're not going to dance on the ruins of the wall. And it was a very, very a wise thing to do. We didn't anticipate that the wall would come down as, as rapidly as it did. I was, at, I was hosting a lunch on the seventh floor, of, uh, eighth floor of the State Department for President Corazon Aquino, who was president of the Philippines, when an, when an aide passed me a note that says the East Germans have announced that the, that the Berlin border is going to be open. And I immediately left the, left the lunch, went down, uh, got on my special phone, talked to the president, went over to the White House, and we started talking from that, at that point about how, we, how we're going to react to these events. Mr. Secretary, let's take, let's take you through and you have a, take us through the major um, facets of this negotiation. So November 9th, 1989 is when the wall comes down, when the border is opened. Um, you've got a lot of problems then. We have a lot of problems because Margaret Thatcher is not enthusiastic about no. the opportunity of a unified Germany, neither is Francois Mitterrand. You have Gorbachev in a very difficult position with his military and the KGB. Uh, it was important in the first couple of weeks for you to reach out to Chancellor Kohl and to establish a joint German-American understanding. What were the first things you thought about as a negotiator, the first steps that you took? Well, we, we, we of course knew that we were going to confront uh, a fairly significant opposition from our allies. Uh, and you can't blame them, you know, they were worried there had been two world wars uh, in that century uh, started by Germany. They were, they were really wary of unifying uh, Germany. They were worried that history might repeat itself. So not only did we have to overcome the objection of the Soviet Union, uh, we also had to overcome, initially at least, the objections of, of our allies. Uh, the State Department had begun doing some, uh, some research and some writing and some thinking about uh, what might happen by way of unification as far back, I think, as, uh, as, no, as uh, September of 89. Uh, but things progressed pretty rapidly after, after the wall came down. We had, uh, I, I remember uh, a meeting that I had on February the 3rd, uh, 1990 with uh, the, for, the German, West German Foreign Minister Hans Dietrich Genscher. And it was at that meeting that we discussed the mechanism that we might use to try and, and unify Germany. There was some initial reluctance even within our administration because this was going to be such a sensitive and, and, and serious topic. But it was my view, and it was view, the view uh, I know of President Bush, that, that, that we'd been talking about freedom for the captive nations of Central and Eastern Europe for 40 years. And we now had an opportunity to try and make it happen. And we certainly should not shirk from that opportunity. We ought to, we ought to do everything we could to make it happen. At this point in time, we weren't concerned much about whether the unified Germany would be in NATO or not. We were very concerned that there not be a neutral Germany in the center of Europe, which we thought would be a force for instability. And we were frankly even concerned that Germany might want to lean, lean eastward. And so we had, to, we had all of those things in, in, uh, on our minds. But uh, on February the 3rd, the German, West German foreign minister came and we met in my office at the State Department. And uh, my, my uh, staff, 
uh, including Nick Burns, who at the time was working for Bob Zellick, but Bob Zellick was, uh, was the counselor of the State Department and, uh, and the head of policy planning. They'd worked up, uh, head of policy planning was uh, uh, a man named Dennis Ross. He and Bob had worked up uh, with Nick's help and other, and the help of others, a, uh, a formula for, uh, for proceeding that, uh, that came to be known as the two plus four formula. That is the two Germanys, East and West, would handle the internal aspects of German unification. And the four occupying powers, France, Britain, Soviet Union, and the United States would handle the external aspect. When I first uh, surfaced th this idea to Hans Dietrich, I said, we ought to do it in a, we, I said, it's gonna be a mistake if we try and do this in NATO. At that time, we had, I think, 15 NATO members. Or certainly we don't want to do it in the uh, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe where there were 32 countries, I think. It would be too unwieldy. So I said to Hans Dietrich, I said, we should do this as, as uh, four plus two. The four occupying powers of the two Germanys. And he thought about it a while and he came back to me and said, you know what, I think we can agree to this provided it's called two plus four and not four plus two. <laughs> Well, that didn't make any difference to us. We agreed to that, and that's the way we went at it. Now, from there, of course, we had to get the agreement of the, of the recalcitrant parties, the Brits, the French, and the Soviets, not only to do it, but to use that process to do it, and ultimately we were able to do that. Thank you. I've got two more quick questions, and I know Jim has some questions as well, and we're gonna take questions from all of you. So think of what you wanna ask the Secretary in this session about German unification. Here's the first question. So you had the strategy. You know you wanted a unified Germany. Of course, we wanted this to occur peacefully by negotiation. You had the tactical framework of the two plus four talks. When did you and President Bush first begin to believe that German unification in NATO was possible? Because I'll bet, I, know, I remember in November and December, I don't, I don't think any of us thought that was going to be possible no. in the immediate wake of the fall of the wall. It was sometime after, Feb after February, probably February 24th, Nick, when, when Helmut Kohl came to the United States and we met with him in, uh, at uh, Camp David. And we talked then about, about uh, and he was very, very strong in favor of uh, getting, he, he really wanted U.S. support for German unification. It was a very big thing to him. He saw, and, and I think we saw, that there was a very narrow window of opportunity here to do something that we had talked about doing for 40 years. And it would be a crime if we didn't take advantage or at least try to do it. We were, of course, we ended up being successful and it was the most profound change in politics and security in Europe for many, many years. Uh, the, and it took place without the firing of, of one shot. But he came, and, and I never will forget at that Camp David meeting, we, we talked to him about U.S. support. This wouldn't have happened, ladies and gentlemen, without the strong support of the United States. And at that meeting, we raised with Chancellor Kohl the, our view that if Germany was to unify, we wanted it to be a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Maybe there could be some special arrangements with respect to the stationing of troops on the soil of the former East Germany, and we ended up uh, agreeing that there could be. But that's where we first broached the, the deal, and I never will forget, we, 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 President Bush was talking to Chancellor Kohl, he said, Helmut, I'm gonna be with you on this, provided you're with us on uh, Germany as a member of the North, the unified Germany as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And Helmut, Helmut Kohl gave us his word and his word was good. And there was never any question about it. We had to worry, of course, about a neutral Germany in the heart of Europe. We had to worry about the potential for Germany maybe leaning eastward. But once that meeting was over, and once he'd given President Bush his word, he was good to his word and we were good to ours. And we picked up the ball and ran with it. When I think about these negotiations, I think about a triangle, uh, United States, West Germany, and the Soviet Union. And so you had firmed up your strategic agreement by the end of February with Chancellor Kohl, but Mikhail Gorbachev, the next month, March 1990, made a very 
strong statement saying no Na Germany yeah. in NATO. You then had to meet him in Moscow, but you also had a summit meeting with President Bush and Gorbachev at, uh, at the first week of May. How did you change Gorbachev's mind? And you had a very close relationship with Eduard Shevardnadze, yeah. the Soviet foreign minister. Describe that process in your thinking. Well, I think that that, I think that, uh, I think Gorbachev finally came to accept uh, reality. Unification was taking place on the ground. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot he could do about it if he wasn't, unless he was going to use uh, the military to keep it from happening. And I've said in many speeches and articles I've written since then that I think history is really going to treat Mikhail Gorbachev and Edward Shevardnadze very, very well because these are the two leaders who made the profound determination that they would not keep the Soviet Union together through the use of force. Up to that time, that's the way it had been had been maintained. And so there was a fundamental determination on their part they wouldn't do that. Furthermore, in, in, unification was taking place on the ground as we proceeded. Uh, at, at the May meeting, the May summit meeting in the White House, President Bush very artfully uh, got Mikhail Gorbachev to admit that, that each country, each any country that was a member of the CSCE, the big big group of 32 countries, which is what the Soviets really wanted. They wanted to put this issue in that organization for it to be decided. But, the, but the, uh, one of the maxims of that organization was each country had the right to decide what alliance it wanted to join. So we have a meeting in the cabinet room, and I'll never forget the dialogue. And President Gorbachev are talking back, back and forth. At some point, President Bush says, well, now you know under the rules of the CSCE, each country has, an op has the option to choose the, the uh, alliance it wants to be in. And, uh, and Gorbachev says, yes. And says, as a matter of fact, the unified Germany could choose to be in the Warsaw Pact. And President Bush says, yes, and it could choose to be in NATO. And President Gorbachev said, yes, that's right. And once he said it could, it, that the unified Germany could make the choice, it was over, basically. Uh, except, except he still was re he was still re was reluctant, if you will remember, and he didn't he didn't really formally commit uh, agree to Ger the unified Germany being in NATO until a meeting he had with Kohl uh, somewhere in where was it Russia in Russia. Yeah. in Russia. Thank you. So it starts with a Z, a big long name in Russia. It starts with a Z. And, uh, and, and so you say, well, why did he choose that time to, to say, okay, we're going to do it? Well, guess what? He got 25 billion Deutschmarks from the West Germans. Now, that's not a matter, I mean, that's a matter of public record. People, people know that. There's never not been a whole lot of conversation about that. But the Soviet Union was in really bad shape economically. It points up uh, what can happen to countries that don't, to do the right thing economically, we, we ought to be thinking about that, but this is not the forum to talk about that in. <laughs> we, I tell people, you know, if we didn't have the dollar as the de facto reserve currency of the world, we'd be Greece, we're in such debt. Uh, but you don't want to hear from a Treasury Secretary today, you want to hear from a Secretary of State. And, but, 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 but the West Germans paid, paid the Soviets. They loaned, maybe loaned, maybe, I think, it was, I think it was just a grant. Something like 25 billion Deutschmarks, just a lot of money. By that time, I think the handwriting was clearly on the wall. There wasn't any way Gorbachev and the Soviets were going to prevent German unification except through the use of force. And they'd renounce that. So that's how it, that's really how Thank you. things change. I was remiss in not um, pointing out to everyone that Professor Karl Kaiser is here. And he really is a bridge between our two countries, and he was a, an advisor to Chancellor Cole at this time. So maybe in the question and answer period, we should hear from Professor Kaiser one of your questions. Jim. You still had a counterpart across the table, Eduard Shevardnadze and certainly Mikhail Gorbachev, who had a lot of internal issues, Huge. KGB, Politburo, military. And one of the things that struck us in, re in studying the, the case in your memoirs was how focused you were on helping them 
with their behind the table challenges, not gloating, yeah. and then the timing of the London Declaration London at Declaration. the NATO summit to give them ammo against their critics. Right. Could you talk a little more about this case, how you help the other side with their internal problems when that's in your interest? Well, uh, and then well, more I, broadly. Oh, sure, a absolutely. Well, I think one major principle of negotiation, of course, is to understand and appreciate the political constraints on the guy across the table. And we knew, we understood those. And, you know, we had, uh, we'd said publicly that we believe these are true reformers. Uh, they really want to try and change the Soviet Union. They want to move, if they can, to a, to a uh, free market uh, model. Uh, and we need to help them. And, and I remember one incident, it's in my memoirs, so, so I can mention it here, where Someone in our administration at a high level went out and, and told a reporter Gorbachev's going to fail. And this was in, I think, 89 or 90, and, and I was sitting over there in the, my office at Secretary of State. I said, wait a minute. I thought we were trying to work with these people. And I picked up the phone and I called the president. I said, you can't have other people pontificating about these major foreign policy matters when this is one of our, our goals and it's totally contrary to our policy. So they cut the knees off of this particular individual, and we didn't hear that anymore. Uh, and and that's that's what you have to do. You got to make sure you got your uh, your domestic house in order. But there were many instances where we took great pains to try and help uh, Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. We had a we they we trusted them. Uh, to be true reformers. We had tested them on this. You, you don't just trust them blindly. We, we had tested them. We, we were satisfied that they were reformers. The London Declaration was a good example. Uh, the London Declaration was nine, nine things we did to NATO to change the character of NATO, to make it more really of a political alliance than a security alliance. And we gave those to the Soviets, and that helped a lot. We did other things. Uh, Later, you know, later on during the Gulf, in the lead up to the Gulf War, when the Soviet Union came together with the United States to support what we did in the first Gulf War, we got money from the, from the Arabs, from the Saudis. And so we were constantly trying to help them in, in, in order to try and, and bring about a peaceful end to the Cold War. As I said earlier, the Cold War didn't have to end peacefully, it could have, been violent, could have ended violently. That's, that's a really interesting, interesting dimension. You see it in a lot of commercial negotiations, too. There's whoever's across the table, but their behind the table problem is often right. as challenging. And how do you help them with that? We well, you, you have to constantly keep that in mind. I mean, you, I think one of, the, one of the most important principles of nego good negotiating strategy is understanding the constraints, uh, political constraints on the guy across the table. If you understand those, then you can work with work with it. Uh, there are a lot of others, of course. Uh, I talked about trust. If you can build a, a relationship of trust with your uh, with your interlocutor, uh, you got a lot better chance of of making a deal if you think you can trust him and he thinks he can trust you. And I had I saw this happen many many times in in the in the negotiations I. I had to do as Secretary of State. Um, I had I, I had a uh, policy difference, for instance, with the Prime Minister of Israel, Itzhak Shamir, who was a very hardline uh, Prime Minister. But on a personal level, we were like this, and we we both respected each other. We liked each other. He, he was the one leader. Well, maybe there were a couple of others. The one leader who would never leak. Uh, we held all of our meetings with no note takers, just him and me, uh, so, so there wouldn't be any problem. But if you can establish a uh, relationship of trust with the, your interlocutor, interlocutor, you got a lot better chance of getting of making a deal. Another big principle that you stress, in fact, one of the chapters in your memoirs focuses on coalition building and coalition maintenance and preventing it, holding it together as one of the key tasks of politics and diplomacy and negotiation where there are a bunch of different parties. And you looked at some potential coalition splitting moves that could have happened in the reunification. 
So speculation that the, the, the Soviets might play on Polish insecurities about the border and that together with the French and the British go slow attitude, that actually might be sufficient to slow things too much. That's an example. Yeah, that's right. You're also concerned, I think, about Gorbachev being very popular and conceivably appealing to uh, European publics to essentially force a choice between unification or NATO, sort of a coalition splitting move that way. You obviously headed those off, but could you talk a little bit about the principles of coalition building and maintenance? And well, it doesn't do any thing? good to, to build a coalition if you can't maintain it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, maybe a better example would be the coalition in the, in the first Gulf War. We'll talk about that in the next session. But building that coalition was difficult, but maintaining it was, was plenty difficult. Maintaining support for our our objective in, in two plus four was also uh, very important and, and not without difficulty because the Soviet leadership was under intense pressure at home, as you've indicated, and, and sometimes they would come. So I remember a meeting uh, in Paris, I think it was, where Shevardnadze came to the table and he would, it sounded like a totally different person than he'd been at the, at the last meeting we'd had talking about German unification. And it soon became apparent to me at least, because I was close to him, that he was, uh, he was posturing for the benefit of his military. And that, that he, what he was saying really wasn't what he believed. So you, you have to constantly work to maintain the coalition. Uh, we really we didn't worry too much about the Polish uh, part of this. We, uh, we worried enough about it that I was in constant, not constant, but I was in frequent contact with uh, Foreign Minister Skubyshevsky of Poland at the time. In fact, we had him come to one of the two plus four meetings so that they would be, feel comfortable about the, what the ultimate result of the German-Polish border would be. Uh, we do know that, that uh, one of our strong allies went, went around us and behind our back to Gorbachev to try, try and get them to slow things down. Uh, I won't tell you whether it was the British or the French, you'll have to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> but you do have to maintain your coalition. How did you deal with that? Well, we didn't make a big a big fuss about it, but we talked about how important it was that we all, you know, stick together and that, look, we talked about freedom for the captive nations of Central and Eastern Europe for 40 years. Why did we want to slow it down? And, and we said this too, you know, we said, yes, perhaps there's some chance that history might repeat itself, but we in America don't believe that's going to be the case. And let me, and, 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 and let me tell you one other thing. We're the ones who have come over here and helped you in World War I, World War II, and now the Cold War. We fought three wars with you in this century. And, and we think this is something that uh, is both morally right, strategically right, something we've talked about doing, and we need to do it. And they, and they ultimately came along, both the British and the French. And they ultimately supported us strongly toward the end. Toward the end. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, let me ask you two questions, one about leadership and negotiating style, and one about the big picture on German unification. Then maybe we want to give the floor to you to have our students and our fellows and professors ask some questions. Nobody negotiates alone. You had a team led by President Bush. You were the principal architect of the strategy. You had a very talented team. You had Bob Zellick, one of the great, great negotiators, and Dennis Ross. Um, what was your principle of leadership of that team? You set strategic direction. You gave Bob and Condi Rice authority to run the two plus four negotiations. Were you in daily contact with Bob Zellick and Dennis Ross and Condi Rice? Did you mm -hmm. micromanage them, or did you give them a lot of authority once you had given them strategic direction? Well, we were we were in pretty constant contact because you never we never knew what was going to come up from what country. Each of these countries, and particularly the ones who were less than wholeheartedly in favor of this, had, had problems. As, they, were, they were subjected to their own domestic problems. And so we, we kept a pretty tight rein on, uh, on who did what and what was said, as you know. And, and that, was, that was really important. And uh, one reason we were able to do that is because I had such a close relationship with the president. 
Uh, I've said, I think I said at lunch, uh, the most important thing for a Secretary of State in terms of whether he or she can be effective is their relationship with, the pre with their president. Uh, everybody in Washington, ladies and gentlemen, wants a piece of the foreign policy turf. And uh, they'll take it if they can get it. Uh, so you need to have, a, and, and every, look, everybody makes mistakes. Secretaries of State make mistakes all the time. So you need a president who will support you and protect you and defend you even when you're wrong. I had that wonderful relationship with this president because we'd been friends for 35 years. He was my daughter's godfather. I had run all of his political campaigns. You don't see that very often. And so nobody was going to get between me and my president. So we had, a, we had a mechanism that functioned very effectively and very well. And we didn't have any lone rangers going off doing their own thing or, or, or saying something that, didn't, that wasn't on script, you know what I mean? I do, and I remember watching, observing as a younger diplomat, you had a very uh, closely integrated team of people from Larry Eagleburger to Bob Zellick to Janet Mullins to Dennis Ross to Margaret Tutwiler, and you got together every morning. Bob Kimmett. Bob Kimmett, to talk about strategy and tactics. Right. Is that part of the success? Let me tell you something else that, that might interest your, your students here in diplomacy. When I went to the, when I first went to the, when, when I, my appointment was first announced, and I went over to the State Department, I said, I want to tell you something, I'm going to be the White House's man at the State Department. I'm not the State Department's man at the White House. All the Foreign Service people said, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> awful. <laughs> but guess what? It worked. Toward the end, when they found out that we were going to control foreign policy, the State Department, not the Defense Department, not the NSC, not because of my relationship with President Bush, that's what the Foreign Service wants. They want to be in the action. So they want a strong Secretary of State. And, and they were... You, speak, you can speak for them. I can't. I wasn't in the Foreign <laughs> Service. But I think they were very happy when, when uh, they realized that we were going we to be the president's number one advisor on formulating and implementing foreign policy. Yeah. That's what they want. You know, I remember, uh, Mr. Secretary, going to work every day, thinking what an extraordinary time it was. The Cold War was ending. That great threat, that sort of Damocles, as President Kennedy talked yeah. about, was vanishing. Mm -hmm. We were effective in the world. We were respected. We were getting things done. We were on the verge of this big achievement that I want to ask you about in this concluding question. Uh, a very different time, say, than now. Yep. Or any time in the last 10 years. Yep. Any, any reflections on that? Well, you know, I say, and I said in my memoirs, uh, I think I said, this was an extraordinary time to be Secretary of State of the United States. Uh, the Cold War had ended. We'd won it after 40 years. Uh, everybody in the world wanted to get close to Uncle Whiskers. I mean, we were it. And it was a very, very good time to, to be Secretary of State because you, you had some leverage that you don't have, that you not, don't always have. We don't have that leverage today. Uh, and, and so we, we set about trying to take advantage of that. And if we hadn't, if we hadn't had that, I'm not at all sure that we... Uh, that the Cold War, we could have presided over a peaceful end of the Cold War, that we could have done German unification or the Madrid Peace Conference or the, or the coalition to eject Iraq from Kuwait. But everybody wanted, and so we, we had strength, and we used that strength in an appropriate way, I think. Right. Mr. Secretary, we talked earlier uh, this morning about what's, our, what's your 5,000-foot view of this achievement and of this issue of German unification. Now, I would say, just to frame this, uh, there's really no one like you in American politics. You had a unique career. You managed five presidential campaigns, Under Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of the Treasury. You, you had a consequential negotiation, the Plaza negotiations, among others. Uh, and then, of course, as Secretary of State at the most interesting and important time in our recent history. Where does this achievement of German unification in NATO rank for you? and all the well, things that you accomplished in your career. Well, I think, uh, first of all, let, let me say that, that something I haven't said yet. I also think one reason I had some of the success I had in negotiating was because I had run those five presidential campaigns. You learn 
you learn, I, I learned a lot as a commercial lawyer uh, make, doing mergers and acquisitions and so forth about negotiating. You learn a lot about negotiating running presidential campaigns, let me tell you. You learn how to be decisive, you, know, you learn, how, learn when to pull back, when to push forward and so forth. But I think that uh, the German unification will be seen to be quite an accomplishment given the narrow window of opportunity that we had to get it done and given the opposition of, of most of our allies and the steadfast opposition of the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union had not been so decrepit economically, I'm not sure we would have gotten it done. I don't know, but we might have. And that's why I keep harking back to our getting our economic house in order in this country. You, you can't, you know, if you're going to be strong politically, uh, militarily, or diplomatically, you've got to be strong economically. And our, our economy in this country is what's been the basis of our strength. Well, you're too modest to say this, so I'll say it. Uh, I think from my perspective, if you look back at the last 40 years, and, and we're just celebrating the 40th anniversary of the opening to China, I think opening to China, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, and German unification and NATO are the two supreme achievements of American diplomacy because they changed the way the world was structured in a positive way and they opened up new possibilities. Well, changed it, uh, changed it and it went without a shot being fired, both of them. In both cases. Which, yeah. mm -hmm. Something intrigued me about the way you described your background leading to Secretary of State. You were a commercial lawyer and like focused on transactions. Mm -hmm. And when we teach about negotiation, it's often about transactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But managing campaigns, when you look at the complexity of these negotiations, it's as if there are a bunch of different fronts. There's the Russian front and the European front and the US government and the broader domestic front. And these fronts have to be orchestrated toward a target deal yeah. with enough support. I wonder if, do you see analogies between managing a, a political campaign and a negotiation campaign? Well, I see a lot, that there's a, what, I'm, what I was trying to say a minute ago is there's a lot of negotiating, I think, that goes into managing uh, presidential campaigns. Uh, you have a lot of discord, usually campaigns have a lot of uh, backbiting and fighting and things like that, and you, you see that a lot in government. I mean, <laughs> Nick knows very well. And so you learn how to head those problems off at the pass, and I think I think those experiences were very, very important to me in, uh, in terms of what we, were, what we were able to accomplish. Again, I think the most important thing was, the, was my relationship with my president. Uh, when I went out somewhere and talked to a foreign leader, they knew I was speaking for him. There were never any questions about it. And there wasn't anybody back here at home questioning what I said, uh, or at least not questioning it on the record. Uh, they might try and question it uh, on background or something, but we'd usually ferret out who they were and take care of it. <laughs> so um, let's turn this over to you, the students, fellows, uh, professors here. Um, my only um, suggestions would be that when you ask the question, why don't you rise and state your name. If you're a student here, what school, what you're studying, and make sure that that question has a question mark. Uh, attached to the end of it, but let me, let me call up first on Professor Kaiser, who teaches at the Kennedy School and who is present at the creation of German unification. Mr. Secretary, as a German, but now also as an American citizen, there is no aspect that impresses us as much as the fact to which you referred. The Cold War could have ended in a bloodbath, yeah. and it didn't. And considering, having lived there at the time, that Nowhere else in the world was there such a concentration of military power as there. One soldier shooting would have changed the course. It didn't happen. Yeah. And we owe a great deal to your leadership and the president's leadership at that time. Now, my question refers to what has rightly been considered the central achievement to get Germany unified in NATO. And that was considered also and I think back of the discussions in Bonn, the central problem. Um, of course, you had an ally, and who had to help on that? Namely, Helmut Kohl, the government. You will remember there was a debate, should there be a new constitution? Should there be a constituent assembly? And that was just eliminated 
East Germany joined West Germany. Right. That, that was <coughs> crucial. Yeah. That meant joined the West, mm -hmm. joined NATO, joined the European Community. That was automatic. That was very crucial that there was a majority for that. But still, there were all the factors that you mentioned that in the end turned Gorbachev around. But there's still one, and you briefly referred to it, and I would like to ask you about it. That specter of neutrality. Uh, the fear that if you didn't unify Germany inside NATO, a different Germany would emerge with a totally different implication for the European structure of states. How did you use it? I, I do remember it uh, once, I think you used the argument, wouldn't a neutral Germany then try to get nuclear weapons? We did use and that. What, what did it in the end? Uh, that that spectrum. Well, we, we, of course, we, we broached that issue, the potential uh, Germany, a uh, neutral Germany in the heart of Europe, we broached that subject directly with Gorbachev. We said, you know, we think you, will be, you, you would be better off with, a, with Germany in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization with restraints on NATO troops on the territory of the German Democratic Republic than you would be with a new, neutral Germany in the heart of Europe. And I think they finally began to believe that themselves. But we had these two concerns. We had the, first, we had the concern that the unified Germany could turn east they could cut some deals with Poland. They could conceivably cut some with the Soviet Union. But when Cole gave us his word, we, we relied on it, and, but, and he, he took steps to reconfirm our belief, uh, belief in our reliance. Uh, but there was never any assurance that, uh, that Germany might not be uh, neutral. But we, I think we sold Gorbachev on, on the risks that would be involved in that. And there would have been risk. But once we made our deal February 24th at Camp David, I never saw any indication from any West German leader, any West German leader, that anybody wanted to, to see a neutral Germany in the heart of Europe, which would have been a force for instability. Just one quick question based on Carl's question. You used the word tr trust with uh, Helmut Kohl. Um, you were President Reagan's chief of staff, when President Reagan famously said, trust but verify. Did, was there that element of trust between you and Shevardnadze and Gorbachev and President Bush? Did you develop that during this crisis? We did. We developed, we developed very good personal relationships. When I mentioned earlier about one of the important aspects of negotiation, I think is if you can develop a relationship of trust with your interlocutor. Uh, I had a really close personal relationship and still do with Shevardnadze, and I found out that I could trust him. I, I knew when he was posturing for his, for his generals and his intelligence services and so forth, but I, he, I never had any occasion where he broke his word to me or, or where he did anything contrary to what he had told me he would do or wouldn't do. And I was in the same way with him, and, and, and President Bush uh, ended up having that same kind of relationship with Gorbachev. You need to have, you need, that, that makes getting things done a hell of a lot easier. Thank you. Other questions? Sir, Josh. Uh, sir, Josh Shippenson, I'm a Kennedy uh, Bill for Center Fellow Speak for the up. year. Speak up. Sorry, Josh Shippenson, Bill for Center Fellow for the year. Sir, I have two related questions, thanks. One, we've made a lot about the fear of backlash coming from the USSR at various points in time in the reunification okay. process. Could you just say a little bit how we thought that process would play out? It seems that the Soviets are quite weak economically, as you pointed out. Gorbachev is under pressure at home. The Eastern Bloc as a whole is falling apart. Uh, what did we imagine the blowback would look like? That's one question. And the then blowback on from what? Well, you want to restate your question? Well, yeah. you're emphasizing the risk of a crackdown in East Germany. How is that going to go if the Eastern Bloc itself is falling by the wayside throughout this period? Uh, the Soviets are weak. They're dependent. They're increasingly calling for economic aid from the West. You understand this question? Because you can translate. So, that. so in other words, was there a realistic possibility that there could have been the use of force by either East Germany or the Soviet Union in the early stages of this? That's right. And that was no. one thing to think the about. The answer to that, in my view, is no. I don't think there was any possibility that the Soviets were going to use force uh, to maintain their position in East Germany, unless we had decided, for instance that we were going to move uh, forcefully in some way. Uh, I, think, I think 
Gorbachev and Chevronadze and others were trying to change the face of socialism, communism, if you will, in the Soviet Union. And they made a fundamental determination at some point that they were simply not going to use force to keep the empire together. Uh, I think I remember when uh, Honecker went out and made some statement uh, in East Germany, and, and Gorbachev said, look, uh, East German policy is, uh, is not determined in Moscow, it's determined in Berlin. Right. Remember that? That was just before November 9th, just yeah. before us. Yeah. Josh, your second question. Right. Um, ve very uh, briefly, if, if Germany was neutralized, if it, went, if it was an independent actor in Europe, and or if it cut deals with the Soviets akin to Rapallo, what did you see as the risks for the United States in, that, in those if, scenarios? If Germany were neutral in the heart of Europe? Yes, that's right. What do I see as the risk to the United States? That's right. Well, you, you, you have the potential then for, for that neutral Germany to develop nuclear weapons, to align itself with uh, bad actors uh, all around the world. Uh, they would not be in treaty obligations with the United States and the West. Those are all the kinds of things that could have happened. But I really don't think there was much chance that was going to happen. I mean, Helmut Kohl didn't have any interest in that happening, nor did Genscher or anybody in the government of the Federal Republic of Germany, nor the East Germans, for that matter. Interesting. Other questions? Yes. Right, right here in the third row. We need to see more students with hands raised, <laughs> or else we'll call on you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for sharing your great insights, especially regarding the German the successful German reunification. Uh, my name is Grace Choi, and I'm a second year uh, Master's of Arts in Law and Diplomacy student at the Fletcher School. Um, my question is in regards to um, when you look at some of the, the things that are coming out of the um, Korean academic community, a lot of people who are interested in the reunification of the Korean Peninsula look towards German unification. <laughs> look towards German unification as a successful um, case to learn from. And I'm wondering if you could possibly provide some, um, maybe two or three uh, s negotiation strategies and tools that you feel like are transferable from the German unification case to cases like Korea or other um, nation states that are interested in multilateral negotiations. That's a good question. Thank you. Right. I'll just Thank you. It. Yeah. So um, as you reflect on the lessons of German unification, yeah. there's another big issue out there. You, fought, you were in the Marine Corps during this war. The Korean War ended in armistice. Right. If there's going to be, in the future, a unification yeah. of, the Koreans, of, the, of the two Koreas, are there, any, are there lessons in how you negotiated German unification that might apply to this current situation? Well, I think there are lessons that could apply to unification on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, you, you have uh, a somewhat uh, different situation because in German unification you had a, a East Germany which was a, a, a vassal state of the, of the Soviet Union. And on the Korean Peninsula you got a terrible uh, uh, <laughs> government in North Korea, a, a really flaky regime, and, uh, they're, and they're hard enough, they're very difficult to deal with. But still, you're going to be faced with some of the same problems. You don't have four power occupation and all of this. And the two Koreas are going to have to be the ones that negotiate their unification. But North Korea is going to want to know that it's got the United States uh, involved in that and behind that. China, of course, is the only country that has any influence whatsoever on North Korea. They don't want to see uh, North Korea uh, blow up in, in, uh, in instability that will send millions of hundreds of thousands of refugees across their borders. So China could play a very important role in this. But the, but the issues are not all that different. You, you have a terrible uh, disparity economically between North and South, just like you had a terrible disparity economically. Korea, I mean, you, how can you negotiate with those people? Have some of the same issues, but first, you, but you can't even start thinking about unification until you get a, 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 a regime that that's not so flaky in North Korea. I mean, you, how can you negotiate with those people? You can't. I mean, I'm I'm one of these people who believes you talk 
to everybody. If you know what you're doing, you're not running any risk by talking. Uh, and as long as you're tough, you talk to your enemies, you don't negotiate peace with your friends, you negotiate peace with your enemies. But I don't know anybody who's had, had any success whatsoever in talking to North Korea. You know, we, we, do it, we do it all the time. We're about to hear, we're, we're on the cusp of doing it again. We send them uh, humanitarian aid and everything, and, and then they don't do what they say they were going to do. It happens over and over and over and over again. So I don't, I don't have, hold out a lot of prospect for anything in the short to medium term happening there, but the issues will be the same. You talked about negotiating with your enemies. Um, I saw you on Charlie Rose the other night, and he asked you about Iran, yeah. and whether or, not, uh, whether or not you thought that the President, President Obama, was right in seeking negotiations. Yes. Do you want to repeat that? I or think, I think, I think uh, President Obama uh, is right on the money uh, in terms of how we ought to react to the, to the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, uh, program that, that we think is coming. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of difference between the American government and the Israeli government on this issue. Uh, in my view, the, the difference is one of, of when and who. You can't, you, we simply cannot have an Iran with nuclear weapons. Not so much because of the threat that they'll attack us or Europe or even Israel, but because of the proliferation threat that this would trigger. Then the, the whole Middle East is going to go nuclear. Uh, Turkey will feel she has to have the bomb, Egypt and so forth, Saudi Arabia. So we can't let that happen. And, and, and if we had to use military assets to prevent it from happening, we could, at the point at which they weaponize. Uh, and we're the ones that have the capability of doing that. We have a much better capacity and capability of doing it than does the Israeli government. So I support uh, what President Obama's position is on the issue of Iran and its nuclear ambitions. Uh, sanctions are beginning to show some effect. I think we ought to keep ratcheting up those sanctions. And it's, uh, you know, you don't need a crystal ball to understand why these uh, uh, nuclear scientists in Iran are dying. Uh, we know why they're dying. And there's nothing wrong with that approach either if you want to keep Iran, if you want to keep Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. So I think we're on the right track. Uh, when you have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff go out here and publicly say that if, that if Israel bombs Iran's nuclear uh, facilities, it's going gonna, it's gonna to result in a, lo a lot of loss of American lives in the region, then I think you have to, you have to pay attention to that. Uh, in, in each of the last two administrations, the government of Israel has asked for overflight rights in-flight refueling capabilities, and bunker-busting bombs. President Bush, 43, at the time when you were working there, I think, said, no, that's not in the national interest of the United States. We're not going to give you that. They came to the Obama administration. The Obama administration said the same thing. No, that's not in the national interest of the United States for you to, uh, to bomb, or bomb Iranian nuclear facilities. Uh, in the first place, we think it'll only delay their getting the bomb. You won't prevent it, and it will create untold consequences in the Middle East, so we're not going to give you those things. Now, I happen to believe that's the right policy. On, on the other hand, I think we ought to make it very clear to Israel, uh, our strong ally, and by the way, they will always be our strong ally, and we will always have their back, as President Obama said, make it clear that in the final analysis, if, it, if we have to do it, We'll take that stuff out militarily. We want to go back to German unification, but I can't help but ask this question. The president's opened up a diplomatic window in Iran. We should be in negotiations in the next 30 to 40 days. What's the probability of success? I know this is, this is peering into the darkness with the Iranians because you don't know their style, but is there a possibility that diplomacy could succeed? I don't know whether there's any possibility. I think I mentioned to you uh, when we were having coffee this morning that when I was a co-chairman of the Iraq study group with Lee Hamilton, uh, I asked President Bush 43, uh, I said, I think it might be worthwhile to talk to Iran because Iran, you talked to Iran and, and when you first went into Afghanistan and they, by the way, they cooperated with you. Uh, because they didn't want to see an unstable uh, Af Afghanistan. And I think we ought to, I, I would like, as chairman of the Iraq study group appointed uh, by Congress at your request, 
to contact the Iranians and say, look, why don't you do the same thing in Iraq that you did in Afghanistan? You, you, have, you don't have any, any uh, you have an interest in a, in a stable uh, Iraq and not an unstable Iraq. And he said, fine, you go ahead and talk to them. And I talked to them uh, at, at the level of the uh, Iranian UN ambassador to the United States. He says, thank you very much for your for your idea, I will communicate it to my government and I'll get back to you. He came back in a week and he said, we don't want to, we don't want to do anything with you uh, in Iraq because we think your, your government is committed to regime change in Iran. So we've had that conversation. <laughs> That's, I guess, the last conversation I know about that we've had with Iran. Okay, thank you. Yes. Right behind you. Yes, thank you. Sorry. You guys will listen. Hi, uh, Magda Davila, second year student from the Harvard Business School. Uh, after the German reunification, uh, not only you put an end to the Cold War, but also you started a new set of relationships with the Soviet uh, Union. When Iraq Kuwait started, did you ever fear that your opposed positions would stretch to match that relationship? And in that case, if the stretch was too strong, which one would have you put the interest first? In keeping the relationship and the German reunification going or in the Iraq Kuwait issue? Tell me. So the question, as I understand it, is, and, um, is, is that the United States was conducting negotiations with uh, the Soviet Union over German unification, but that as we proceeded into 1990 with the invasion, of uh, Kuwait by Saddam Hussein August 1st, we then had another big issue with the Soviets. That's correct. And so how did you balance those two big issues with Gorbachev and Shevard and Were they in conflict with each other? We had those two big issues, you're quite right. And let, me, and let me tell you something very interesting about this international, we're gonna talk about this in the next session, but this unprecedented international coalition that we were able to pull together to kick Iraq out of Kuwait it never would have happened but for this event. I was on August the 2nd, August the 1st, I was in Irkutsk, Siberia, uh, negotiating arms control agreements with Edward Shevardnadze, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, and I received a message from Washington, from the State Department, saying, we're really worried about the fact that Iraq is massing troops on the border of Kuwait. You might want to ask your interlocutor there what he knows about that, Soviet foreign minister, because Iraq was a client state of the Soviet Union. So I turned to him, I said, Edward, we're worried about, we're worried about this. What do, you, what, what do you think? He said, oh, he wouldn't be so foolish as to do that. <laughs> and I said, well, our CIA is really concerned about it, and, and uh, we know there are a lot of troops massing there. You might want to check with the KGB at lunch. We broke for lunch, he came back, he said the KB, KGB said there couldn't be anything of that. He would not be so foolish. And so I flew off, and we finished our negotiation. I flew off, I was going to Mongolia because here was the first communist country in Asia that was, that was reforming and embracing democracy and free markets, sandwiched in between the big, two big communist giants. So I thought it would be important to, to show the flag there. And I was in Mongolia when the invasion happened. I got on the phone, of course, to the president, but then I also talked to the, my traveling squad, and we, and we, we decided we would try to, to uh, we, by that time we had a really good relationship with Chevron Nazi, we were negotiating German unification, that we would try to fly back through Moscow, come back to the United States. I, I quickly canceled my trip in Mongolia. So we, we'd fly back through Moscow. If he would stand up with me, and condemn this uh, invasion of, uh, of a small country by a big neighbor, even though it was a client state of the Soviet Union. I got a, he said he would. I, he, and by the way, he did this without ever clearing it with Gorbachev. I got on the airplane, flew to an airport in Moscow, stood shoulder to shoulder, the United States Secretary of State and the, Soviet, and the Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union, and we condemned the actions of a Soviet client state and, and proposed an arms embargo on Iraq. That was an extraordinarily fortunate uh, circumstance. That was the beginning of the international coalition that we pulled together to kick Iraq out of Kuwait. Because if the Soviets hadn't been in it, 
And we, you know, they could always have vetoed our resolution in the UN Security Council. But so, so your, your question is very pertinent, and, and we, were, we, we managed to handle both of those at the same time, and they were both very important issues. We have time for maybe two more questions. We're going to break it uh, at 2.45. We're going to take a 45-minute break and come back at 3.30. Two more questions. Yes, all the way in the back right here. Thank you very much. My name is Bernhard Metz. I'm a student at the Kennedy School, MPA, second year. Um, and my question is on uh, the, the, ally, the ally, we don't know if they are British or French, as you mentioned, <laughs> that was trying to slow down um, the process with the Soviet Union. Um, so the question is, how did you or who did actually finally manage to appease them and in which way? So there are some that this ally was kind of bought by um, the Maastricht Treaty and the European Union and above all the Euro, which decreased the power of Germany. But yeah, the question is, was this really the reason or was there some other things? So I'll, I'll just that. restate it for everybody. So uh, in the first 30 days after the wall fell, you had to negotiate with Margaret Thatcher and Francois Mitterrand. And I'll just say this and it's in some of the readings that I've assigned from my course. We know that Francois Mitterrand went to Kiev and met with Gorbachev in early December of 1989, and he was not exactly with the program uh, of the United States. So you had coalition politics. Before you could really focus on the Soviets and the East Germans, you had to consolidate our positions with Britain and France, our two closest allies. Right. How difficult was that? Well, we had to do that. We had to consolidate our positions with Britain and France, but, but we had a lot of help. We had help from Helmut Kohl, and I'll tell you why. Helmut wanted to see Germany unified, quite understandably, and Francois Mitterrand wanted to see European Monetary Union. And they cut a deal, right? That's what, my, that's what I think, I wasn't in the room, but I would almost bet you that, Francois Mitterrand, that Helmut Kohl got Francois Mitterrand to agree to German unification if Kohl would agree to uh, economic, uh, economic union in Europe. That meant the Germans, of course, would have to give up their Deutschmark, something they might now be very sorry for. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what happened, in my view. So we had a lot of help in bringing the French along, anyway. And, and Margaret Thatcher, she's a strong world uh, power. Yeah but, but, yeah, but Margaret wasn't, gonna, wasn't going to uh, pose. Um, you know, she was worried that history would repeat itself. She really was. And she was, at first, rather, rather, uh, rather strongly opposed to German unification at this time. She would have said, we need, yes, we've talked about it for 40 years, and we need to do it, but maybe right, not, not right now. Well, after France said okay, and then it was apparent we were beginning to move the Soviets. She wasn't going to say no. She was going to, I think, come along with us, and she did. So by February of 1990, when you formed the 2 plus 4 talks in Ottawa, you had all the allies behind us. We, got, we got the 2 plus 4 talks agreed to, and I was in Ottawa at the Open Skies Conference, yeah. and that's where I negotiated with uh, uh, Douglas Hurd from the UK, Roland Dumas of France, and Edward Shevardnadze of the Soviet Union and got their agreement right. to, the, to the two plus four. And you were sure at that time of that, that Cole and Genscher were also on board that time? Yeah, well, we made sure that Cole and Genscher were on yeah. board at that time. You don't want to go into all that, do you? It's in the book. I got yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all the way in, uh, Lillian, all the way in the back. Tell her to speak up. <laughs> got 80, a pair of 82-year-old ears down here. They got <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Lillian Langford. I'm a third-year student here at the law school and at the Kennedy School. Um, Secretary Baker, you mentioned that although reunification seemed inevitable um, by the time the wall fell, the actual fall of the wall occurred much faster than anyone expected. And so one of the things mm -hmm. that we talk about a lot here in the negotiation program is being always prepared for your negotiation. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how, how um, you were able to just recalibrate, really, um, the American strategy towards reunification, given this very unexpected and fast event that changed the landscape. 
So the question is, essentially, as I understand it, Lillian, um, one of the important qualities of a negotiator and a diplomat is to be always prepared. You had very little time after November 9th, 1989, to put together a strategy, a team, a tactics to unify all of these countries. Um, talk about that important element of preparation and discipline, be always being perhaps better prepared than anybody else in the room when you enter it. Uh, my life has been guided by a, a motto that my father gave me at an early age, and it says, it's the five Ps, and it says prior preparation prevents poor performance. And that's what I've always believed. And it's a, it's a silly little saying, but let me tell you something, it's always served me very well. I mentioned earlier that we were doing studies, so we were doing papers and, and writing studies and things in the State Department as far back as May or maybe even March or April of 1989 about the potential for German unification. And you're quite right that we had a very narrow window of opportunity within which to act. But, but we, uh, we acted reasonably uh, quickly, and of course it ended up being effective. But you, I think I said earlier that it was only February of, uh, of 90 when Genscher came to the State Department and we kicked around the idea of how we would do this, and we decided we would do it under two, in two plus four. And by the way, our NATO, other NATO allies really didn't like that at all. They raised unshirted hell in, in, in London, in, in Paris, and in, and in Washington. They didn't like it that they were not a party to this, uh, but they weren't. We didn't get so much flack from the CSCE because there were 32 countries there and it didn't really make sense to put it in there. But we had started work, we had started thinking about German unification as far back as May of 89. Right. Before we break, Mr. Secretary, I just I wanted to ask this question. You're talking about prior preparation prevents poor performance. Now I've got it down. Mm -hmm. um, you could make it six Ps. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I noticed about you when I was working at the State Department, and I reminded the Secretary of this, the Secretary had to testify before Congress, our, our con committees, Senate Foreign Relations, House International Relations. You had to testify for your confirmation. We would give you these huge briefing books with several hundred issue papers. I remember once we gave you this briefing book on a Friday and on Monday morning you came back in the office and you, you had underlined and marked up every single page. So you believe in the five Ps, that's for sure. But uh, the discipline and the hard work and just the exhaustion of being Secretary of State, you're flying all over the world, you've got this weight of the world in your shoulders. How did you handle that? And, was that a big factor in how you did your I job? I was always taught to do my homework, and, and what, what you're talking about on the book is just doing your homework. Uh, the job of Secretary of State is very difficult once you get out there and start traveling a lot. Uh, it's very uh, debilitating. Uh, I think I went to 10 or 12 uh, countries uh, in, in two days, or maybe, maybe three days, maybe a little few more countries, but putting together the coalition to kick Iraq out of Kuwait. And I was on the road all the time. I found something called Halcyon, which, they, which the doctors came out and said, boy, that's really bad for you. It, you it should, it'll kill you. You should never take it. But boy, it sure worked for me. And, and I, I, but of course, an, another thing that helped was I had a great big 707 with a stateroom in it and a bed, and a lot of Air Force stewards to serve me whatever I needed. The poor staff had to sit in the back of the plane and go to sleep in their, in their chair like this on these long, long flights. But you, you do have to have a strong constitution. Uh, I, I think Se Secretary Clinton has talked about this, maybe. Uh, she's found out that, uh, that the job is, is, uh, is tough from a physical standpoint, as well as a mental standpoint. Good. We're going to come back after a break, and we're going to um, talk about the Gulf War Coalition. Professor Sabanius will lead that, and the Madrid process. At 3.15, I've been told. 3.15, so that's one half hour from now. Thank you. Thank you.